Okay, let's move on now to ethics. So what is ethics? Well, this refers to a code of moral principles that people follow with respect to what is right or wrong. Ethical principles are not necessarily enforced by law, although the law incorporates moral or ethical judgments. Okay, so theft obviously is wrong ethically and also punishable legally. So again, don't make this confusion. Sometimes students make this mistake and they think that everything that is unethical is illegal or everything that's illegal is unethical. You don't want to make uh, confusions between those two categories. You want to keep them distinct. But in most cases, legal requirements are also ethical requirements. They're moral obligations, of course. You can't uh, steal. It's not just that it's illegal. It's also unethical. It's immoral. But not all immoral and unethical activities are going to be illegal. Okay. A number of factors might be worth considering when determining whether something is ethically right or wrong. So values, that is to say the values of the organization. Okay, so the internal values of the organization, the identity, the mission, the goals of the organization, they need to be factored in for any given action or activity. Principles, these are abstract rules. Okay, so these are more general ethical principles that might be prevailing within the society. Motivations, okay, so this refers to the preferences of the organization and it's particularly important when it comes to shareholders, okay, so you do have an obligation towards shareholders in terms of trying to maximize uh, shareholder wealth and they're going to desire the maximization of wealth in most cases and so that has to be factored in when making ethical decisions because within an organization because of course it is your duty as a worker in the organization to ensure that uh, shareholder wealth is maximized. And then consequences, okay? You have to also consider the outcomes of the action. So these are all potential sources of obligation within an organization. And the key point here is that you need to balance all of these different considerations while you're trying to figure out what the ethical course of action is, okay? And in some cases, you might have to ignore certain kinds of motivations, for example, because they're unethical or indeed because they're illegal. So there are a range of approaches that can be taken when making ethical decisions. And there are a number of different positions we're going to look at briefly here. These are ethical positions from a philosophical perspective. Okay, we're not going to get too deep into the philosophy, but it's worth just knowing some of these terms because, of course, uh, philosophies do, in some cases, underpin the kinds of actions that organizations are willing to take and that they want to avoid. Okay, so one ethical position is called egoism or egoists, ethical egoists. They look after their own needs when making a decision and don't consider the needs of others. In the case of an organization, you can think of an egoistic organization as one that only thinks about its own interests and disregards all other stakeholders. Pluralists then consider when uh, whether other stakeholders are compromised by a decision. So again, they're thinking of value, not just from the internal perspective, from the external or stakeholder perspective as well, and trying to balance all of those considerations. Absolutists, on the other hand, are concerned about whether a course of action is fundamentally correct in itself. Okay, so the idea of absolutist is they don't really care about consequences of actions. They're just worried about whether the action itself is ethical or unethical. Okay, so for example, just to give you an example so you're not confused, you can imagine that someone is an absolutist about lying. They would say, for example, that lying is always wrong in any circumstance. Now, most people think that actually that's probably not true because you can think of circumstances where you might have an ethical obligation to uh, tell a lie in order to protect someone. So, for example, you can imagine if uh, a murderer shows up at your door and they're looking for someone who they're looking to kill and you happen to know that this person is hiding inside your house. OK, and this person inside your house is completely innocent but you also know that this murderer is going to kill the person inside the house. In that case, you might ask, well, do you have an obligation to tell the truth to the murderer? Do you have the obligation to tell them where the person is? And most people would say, actually, in that case, you do not have a moral obligation to tell the truth. In fact, you have a moral obligation to lie and to deceive the murderer. OK, so that's just an example of how some people think that absolutism actually isn't the correct way to think about morality. It's more about balancing a number of different values and factors. Consequentialists then, they primarily focus on the consequences of a decision before determining a course of action, okay? So in that example that I gave you there, you could think of that as a consequential decision. You're thinking about what will happen if I tell the, this uh, lie or what will happen 
if I tell the truth. And the consequences are the things that determine whether or not you take the relevant course of action. And then you have utilitarians, okay? Utilitarians are about maximizing overall benefits, okay? And you, global utilitarians are looking at the entire society. So they're thinking, how can we maximize the benefits to society at large when making a decision? Now, we're looking at a number of different positions here. I'm not saying that any of these are necessarily correct. However, I will say that within the context of modern organizations, you're going to get more commonly a mix of pluralists and consequentialists, okay, you're, and utilitarians as well, to some degree when it comes to corporate social responsibility, thinking about wider society and benefits to wider society. Absolutists, not really very common anymore, okay, Th people who think that it's always wrong to do certain things and there's no exceptions. And egoists, of course, generally are considered not to have much place in the modern organization because, of course, you have to think about stakeholders, as we'll see later on. OK, but it's worth knowing, at least, that these are different potential positions that one can take in the context of ethics. OK, so let's focus now specifically on ethics in organizations. Organizations are coming under increasing pressure to adopt an ethical approach towards the following, of course, towards stakeholders employees, customers, competitors, suppliers, and indeed, in some cases, society as a whole. Environmental issues are becoming increasingly important from an ethical perspective, such as climate change and recycling. Disadvantaged in society, okay? So increasingly, organization, organizations are expected to have some consideration for how they might be able to benefit uh, through their actions, the disadvantaged or some disadvantaged groups within society. And then how they deal with unethical companies or governments. Again, we've seen many examples of this in recent years. OK, we're thinking of controversial cases like, for example, Apple, in the case where they were sourcing some of their uh, uh, parts for phones from factories in which people were deemed to be uh, treated unethically. Working conditions were poor and there was a lot of protest about this and so on. And so the question is, do they have an ethical obligation to stop dealing with uh, those kinds of organizations that have um, allegedly unethical practices in place. So that's another uh, aspect, especially in the globalized world, this is becoming increasingly important. So ethical dilemmas are really the most important uh, consideration when it comes to applying ethics in the context of organizations, okay? So it's all well and good talking about ethical principles in the abstract, but this is where they really, this is where the rubber meets the road, so to speak, when it comes to ethics. It's when you're faced with an ethical dilemma within the organization. So this is a situation in which a decision maker has to decide what is right or what is the wrong thing to do, usually in a context of conflicting interests and or commitments. OK, so when you have a number of different stakeholders, for example, OK, people who have different kinds of claims on the activities of the organization and you're not sure how to balance those different interests and where the courses of action mean that some people's interests or values are compromised and others aren't. Okay, so those are typically your ethical dilemma situations and you want to employ ethical principles to try and guide you through those situations. So let's look at some examples then of ethical dilemmas that might arise in organizations. Creative accounting. Okay, I'm sure you've come across this before. I'm sure you've heard about creative accounting, the attempt to manipulate accounts in order to conceal or exaggerate reported profits or losses in the case of concealing. So, of course, there's always going to be a temptation. Well, perhaps not always, but often there will be temptation to ensure that you uh, maximize the profits and how uh, they appear Okay, in your financial statements. You might get pressure from senior management, for example, to ensure that they're presented in the most favorable light. And this might compromise your integrity, as we'll see later on, as a SEMA professional management accountant. We're going to come back to that in a little bit more detail when it comes to those ethical principles. You have potential of, for example, uh, ethical dilemmas in the context of directors' pay. So directors awarding themselves generous bonuses in a situation where the company is performing poorly, for example. That can be looked on very unfavorably and as a, an unethical practice. Bribes are another case of potential ethical dilemmas. So paying prospective partners, clients, or project sponsors in order to win contracts, especially where in some countries, bribes are deemed routine or uh, acceptable. Okay, so there might be some cultures where bribes are not 
frowned upon to the same extent ethically as they are in some other nations. And the question then becomes, well, which uh, principles do we comply with? Which ethical obligations do we comply with those in the in the uh, uh, foreign country or those in your native country where the organization operates? Product decisions sometimes raise ethical dilemmas. So, for example, you could ask the question, are certain products inherently unethical to produce and sell? So cigarettes is one of the more commonly cited examples. Should products that damage the environment, for example, be sold at all? So making decisions about what products to produce, this is obviously something that needs to have an ethical component as well as a financial component. Advertising. So is it ethically appropriate to advertise potentially controversial or unhealthy products to children? Hiring practices. OK, so, for example, employers may actively avoid or discourage the hiring of young married women on the assumption that they are more likely to become pregnant and miss work as a result. Health and safety. A company may wish to cut back on health and safety training, for example, in an effort to reduce costs, despite it potentially putting employees at greater risk. And then anti-competitive behavior. OK, so companies might engage in overt illegal anti-competitive behavior. So, for example, price fixing. But there also might be more subtle forms of anti-competitive behavior. And the question is, is that ethical? So you might think of an example for uh, encouraging suppliers to not supply a new entrant into the market in order to squeeze them out and prevent them from making a, a big impact on the market. That's just one uh, example. Now, the thing in all these cases is that in many of these cases, you're going to have strong financial incentives to actually engage in some of these activities. OK, so you might be uh, very financially incentivized to uh, offer bribes or to produce a product that you know is going to harm uh, the customers if they decide to purchase it and so on and so forth. OK, so in many cases, ethical dilemmas arise in organizational contexts when there's a conflict between the obligation to maximize shareholder wealth on the one hand and other ethical duties on the other. OK, so ethical duties to other stakeholders like customers and their values and their preferences. OK. So how do we approach ethical dilemmas? Well, SEMA has outlined certain principles which are very useful when it comes to approaching ethical dilemmas. All SEMA members and registered students are subject to SEMA's Code of Ethics for Professional Accountants. OK, now bear that in mind. That's for SEMA members and students, registered students. That is you right now. OK, so you are already required to comply with SEMA's Code of Ethics. So this is already something that's practical and has real world application. OK, so how you conduct yourself online, how you conduct yourself in your interactions with other SEMA students and so on. OK, you're going to have to ensure that you're manifesting these ethical principles. So these guidelines make it clear that individuals must observe the highest standards of conduct and integrity, uphold the good standing reputation of the profession, refrain from any conduct which might discredit the profession. And here we have all of the principles, OK? We have all five of these principles and there is a useful mnemonic which you can use to remember these principles and that mnemonic is PIPCO, OK? So let's go through each of the principles in turn. Professional competence and due care, OK? So this is relating to uh, the fact that you are expected to be up to date, OK, on all of the most recent standards, for example, accounting standards, to ensure that your training is up to date, OK? And to ensure that those who work under you, if you're in a senior management position, are adequately trained, have the proper training in order to ensure that they're actually competent and they're able to take due care when it comes to their uh, duties, their financial activities and accounting activities. Integrity then relates to honesty. OK, so the idea here is that you are straightforward and honest and direct in all of your dealings as a management accountant. Professional behavior. This is basically the idea that you should not engage in any behavior which brings the profession as a whole into disrepute. OK, that compromises the reputation of management accounting. Confidentiality. OK, so the idea here is that both your employers and clients have a right to uh, keeping 
uh, confidential information from getting out into the public, from being shared with third parties and so on. Okay, so you have an obligation then, corresponding obligation towards your employer and clients to ensure that confidential information is not shared with third parties unless you're given special dispensations to do so. And then finally, objectivity. The idea of objectivity is to ensure that your personal biases, your personal prejudices, and indeed your personal preferences do not get in the way, okay? Do not dictate the decisions that you make. You're always thinking of your obligations towards the organization as a whole and towards stakeholders, key stakeholders for the organization. Those things come first as a senior professional uh, and your personal preferences, biases, and so on are subordinated and you need to set those aside. So they're the five key principles, SEMA's code of ethics, professional competence and due care, integrity, professional behavior, confidentiality, and objectivity, okay? So if this is your first time coming across these, I cannot emphasize enough how important these principles are. They come up again and again throughout your SEMA studies at all levels, at the management level, the strategic level, in the case studies as well. Really, really important, the case study exams. You're going to be required to show that you can apply these principles in order to resolve some dilemmas that might arise, to show how, that you know how to conduct yourself in a potentially compromising position ethically. Okay, let's do this now. Let's put this into practice and see if you can answer this question. So Jacob is a SEMA member and financial controller of the company XPLC, a large company manufacturing furniture. XPLC is currently looking for a new supplier of printed fabrics. Three suppliers are being considered, one of which is Y Limited, and Y Limited is owned by Stacy, an old school friend of Jacob's. Okay, Stacy has asked Jacob to put in a good word for Y Limited with the procurement manager of XPLC. Stacy knows that Jacob is good friends with XPLC's procurement manager. Okay, so there's your story. So Stacey wants Jacob to put in a good word with the procurement manager of XPLC. Which one of the following principles would Jacob be violating by agreeing to Stacey's request? Confidentiality, activity, professional competence, or integrity. Okay, so just take a moment there to think about it and let's see if you can get the right answer. Okay, so let's see if you got it. The correct answer is objectivity. Okay, so clearly Jacob's uh, objectivity is potentially compromised here in this situation. If he follows through on Stacy's request, he's letting personal preferences, bias, prejudice get in the way. His personal background relationship with Stacy is potentially getting in the way of making an objective decision of X making the best decision when it comes to choosing who to deal with, okay? Who's going to be the new supplier of printed fabrics. So objectivity, objectivity means ensuring that business is not compromised by bias or by conflict of interest. 